So our first real statistical analysis that we've been working with utilizes our knowledge of the way samples from a normally distributed population behave. Okay, and I'm going to go through that very quick, very, very quickly now. Okay, so here we have a normal population, normally distributed population. It's got a mean mu, whatever that number represents, and it's got a standard deviation sigma. We know that if we take repeated random samples from this population, that if we were to take each one of the means of those samples, say a sample of size 10, sample of size 25, a sample of size 100, right? We know that if we were to take the, take a sample over and over again, size 10, and then write down what the, uh, what the average was, say 90, and then do it again, and write down what the average is in 85, do it again, uh, 87, so on and so forth. Well, if we were to take all of those averages that were based on a sample size 10 from this population, then all of those averages would be normally distributed also. And the mean of those repeated samples, if we took enough of them, would be the same thing as the mean would approximate, let me call it approximates, the mean of the population. Right? Makes sense, because half the time you'd expect to get a number lower, half the time a number higher, and they'd have to reach out. You'd expect to get about the same mean for all of these samples as well. However, you would also expect, since you're averaging 10 values, that you're not going to get extreme values like the person that's way out here, three standard deviations away from the mean in the population. You would expect that those averages would be closer to the mean. And in fact, they are closer to the mean. And that relationship is given by the, the uh, uh, formula sigma over the square root of, over the square root, whoops, the square root of the sample size. Okay, that is our standard deviation for repeated sample sizes, for repeated samples of certain sizes. And we also know that at, because as n gets bigger, this number gets smaller, the standard deviation of these repeated samples gets smaller, that in fact our distribution gets narrower, right? So our standard deviation of these sample means as the sample size gets bigger, the distribution gets narrower. The standard deviation goes down because the n, n is in the denominator rather than the numerator. Well, to avoid confusion, we often like what we, we're going to refer to when we take a sample of 10 people, we're going to refer to the mean of that as x bar, and we're going to refer to the standard deviation of those 10 people as SD or standard deviation. To avoid confusion with that standard deviation of a sample and the standard deviation of repeated samples taken over and over again and the averages redistributed, we're going to call this the standard error instead. Right? But it is really a standard deviation of all these repeated sample means. Okay, so that's how we're that's how we're dealing with this uh, 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 this value, the understanding what this value is. Um, I'm going to go to the chat box just to make sure you guys can hear me clearly and can see the screen. I trust you can. If you could, you could type into the chat box. If you have a question as we progress, I have some questions that people have emailed me or posted to Blackboard at Blackboard Discussions Forum and so on uh, that I'm going to address as we go on. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we're in communication. Okay, um, you know I can I, I think as we go through this, you're gonna fi find you're gonna find that I'm uh, uh, gonna be reviewing material that's covered on the exam, but I really can't go in there and just review the individual problems, right? So let me see. Let's get through this, and at the end, I think that you'll find that we addressed uh, a lot of your questions. Okay. Um, uh, how we, uh, well, yes, we're going to cover that. Definitely, we're going to talk about the null hypothesis. You guys are getting way ahead of me here. Okay, so at any rate, this is, this, is a, this is a property that we understand about the population and how it relates to repeated samples and distribution of those sample means. Okay, in fact, interestingly enough, if the 
population isn't perfectly uh, the best situation is when you have a perfectly normal distribution. But we we're, it's okay to have it approximately normal as well. But the more normal it is, the better. Okay, and in fact, uh, if we have a large enough sample size, um, uh, the uh, distribution of the sample means will be normal, even if this isn't quite normal. But for the most part, we want this to be this this one want the, the population to be normal, and that'll produce a normal distribution of the sample means. Okay, so let's move on from there. How can we apply that? Why is this important to us? Okay, the reason why this is important to us is because we can take advantage of this property to understand how reliable a single sample might be based on its sample size. Okay, so I'll give you an example here. Let's say that uh, we're looking at uh, blood pressures of a population and um, uh, uh, we, have a pop we have a normally distributed population and the mean of that population, mu, is equal to 80 and the standard deviation is equal to 10. If I take repeated samples of size 100, and I then, uh, or even if I take a single sample of size 100, okay, and that single sample gives me a mean that's equal to, maybe it won't come out exactly 80, maybe it comes out to 81 or something like that, right? So, so if that gives me a, uh, uh, those repeated samples give me a mean of uh, 81, well, I can, uh, I'll, in most cases, in almost all cases, I should say, we're never going to know the mean of the entire population. In fact, if we knew the mean of the entire population, we wouldn't bother with that taking a sample. We know all about all, what, all that we needed to know about it anyway, right? And we also typically won't know the standard deviation. But for the moment, I'm going to say that we don't know what that is. It's, it is 80, but we don't know what it is. But we do know the mean, the standard deviation is equal to 10, for whatever reason, whatever way that might occur. Okay, we're going to take a leap of faith. So we know that this approximates the approximates mu, okay, the population standard deviation. So we would we could say to ourselves, you know, if that if that really is this sample of size 100, if I got lucky and that happened to be uh, the mean of the population, well, that would also be the mean of my repeated samples as well. And if I took many repeated samples, I would expect 95% of those repeated samples to be within two standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviations above the mean. Remember that from the uh, um, uh, our uh, uh, understanding of how the normal distribution worked. Okay, so in fact, we know really it wasn't really 95%. It was one point not. It wasn't really two. It was one point one not minus one point not one. Point one one point nine six uh, standard deviations below the mean and one point nine six standard deviations above the mean would capture ninety five percent of the possible outcomes. Okay, well, you know the problem is is that we don't know that eighty one is really the mean, so we can't really use it to predict what the uh, what another sample would look like. However, we can say to ourselves, well, you know, we got eighty one here. And we know that that 95% of the time, 81 is going to be within uh, 1.96 standard deviations of what the real population is, because if we had taken the original samples, we would have expected that. So instead of using it this way, we're going to use it to create a confidence interval. And that confidence interval is going to be equal to, it's going to be equal to whatever we got from our sample mean, plus or minus two standard deviations times the standard error, the amount of variability that we would expect in repeated samples of that size. And what's standard error equal to? Standard error is equal to sigma over the square root of the sample size, or in this case, it's equal to a 10 over the square root of 100, which is 10, and that's equal to 1. Okay, so we would expect that confidence interval is equal to x bar plus or minus 2 times the standard error, so that would be 81 plus or minus two times the standard error, which is one. So we would expect our confidence interval to be between 79 and 83. Well, what kind of confidence interval would that be? Two standard deviations above and below. In other words, 
five, two and a half percent uh, of the time we could be wrong on the low side, two and a half percent we could be wrong on the high side. In other words, we could be wrong five percent of the time. Well, we'd be right 95 percent of the time. Well, what would we be right about? We would be right to predict that the true population mean is within two standard deviations below 81 and or two standard deviations above 81. We can't tell which because we don't know, we'll never know what the mean is. In fact, even when we're done with this, we won't know what the mean is, but we'll know that we're 95% certain that we'll be between these two numbers. Now, again, I kind of lied to you again. This is really 1.96, right? Why is that 1.96? Because if you look at the standard the standard normal distribution, if you look at the table, in order to get 2.5% in the bottom tail and 2.5% in the top tail, you would have to be 1.96 standard deviations, a z-score of 1.9 standard deviations in either direction from the mean. So if I, if I actually calculate this out the way I should, then 1.96 times 1 is, is going to make our confidence interval 79.04 to 80, 82.96. Uh, nine, nine, six, right? It's gonna, that's going to be our confidence interval. We're 95% sure that our true population mean is between these two numbers. If I wanted to be 99% sure, well, then I would have to use the z-score here that represents 99% of the normal distribution. And we know that that would mean that we have half a percent here and half a percent here. And if we look that up on the on the Z table, the Z distribution table, then we would see that that would be a value of 2.58 and minus 2.58. So instead of multiplying by 1.96, our confidence interval, 99% confidence interval, is going to be equal to X bar plus or minus 2.58 times the standard error. Okay, And if I wanted to do a 90% confidence interval, it would be x bar plus or minus uh, uh, 1.64 times the standard error. One is this, one being the standard error because we know what sigma is and we know the sample size. Okay, so you can work that out on your own. Just add and subtract them. Just as a matter of uh, definition, this thing that we're adding and subtracting from the mean in order to build our confidence interval. This thing that we're adding and subtracting, that's called the margin of error. Makes sense, right? X bar plus or minus the margin of error, right? See, it's a perfectly logical way to describe this. Okay, so th this is basically what we're doing. So what this tells us is we're 95% sure that the true confidence interval, that the, the true population mean lies between the, these two numbers, okay? because we knew what sigma was, and we had a result for a sample size of 100 uh, 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 that came out to be 81. Now, we're not 100% sure, we'll never be 100% sure, but we, we certainly now have, we are able to quantify what our level of certainty about where the population mean is. So this really helps quite a bit. Okay, now just so you understand, now, now this means that not when we do a sample like this, 95% of the time we will capture the population mean. That means if I did this a hundred times, my expectation there's no guarantee of this, of course, but my expectation of this was 95% of the time I'd have a range that captures the mean, and 5% of the time I have a range that doesn't capture the machine, so the um, the uh, uh, mean. So uh, uh, out of a hundred times, I 95 times I would be correct with my confidence interval, and five times I would be incorrect with my confidence interval. Right, that, you know, again, that's due to chance a little bit. You know how it is. You go to a casino, and maybe you'll be right 96% of the time, maybe 92% of the time. But based on probability, that's what our expectations would be. This does not tell us, this does not tell us uh, 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 anything about uh, the population, it doesn't mean that the uh, mean is definitely between these things. Uh, it only tells us that we're 95% sure that the true population uh, uh, mean is, be, uh, is likely to be between these two numbers. Okay, so now 
There's a little bit of a problem there, isn't there? I just told you we knew something that I, in the sentence before, I told you that we almost never know, right? And what was that? We almost never know mu or, or a standard deviation uh, for a population. So here's our population. It's a mystery to us. We don't know what the mean is. We don't know what the standard deviation is, right? Both of these are mystery to us, right? So let's say we take a sample. This time I'm going to take a sample of size. I'll do it again. Sample size 100. It's an easy number to work with. And I'm going to say our mean for that sample came out to be 160. Maybe it's uh, weights for uh, athletes on the uh, uh, high school uh, football team. And I said to myself, okay, I took a sample of 100, size 100 for all the athletes in the uh, uh, police athletic uh, uh, high school football league. And, and I got an average for those 100 students, 100 student athletes of 160. Okay, now there may be 10,000 kids participating in that, in that program, but we didn't have the resources to actually uh, get the weights of every one of them, but we randomly sampled 100 of them. Okay, so now what does that tell us about the true population mean mu? Okay, well, what it tells us is, is that we can predict a range for the true population mean. How do we do that? Again, we create a confidence interval. I'm going to start with a 95 percent confidence interval. The 95% confidence interval is going to be X bar plus or minus. Uh, it's going to be the Z score, depending on what, depending on which, whether it's 95, it might be 1.96. If it's 99%, it's 2.58. If it's 90%, it's 1.64. And notice that the, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a second about the width of the confidence interval. Okay, so we have X bar plus or minus whatever Z score I'm going to use times the standard error, okay? Okay, so now if I want a 95% confidence interval, I'm going to use 1.96, okay, times the standard error. Now let me calculate that standard error. That standard error is going to be equal to sigma over the square root of the sample size. Well, i got a problem here. I don't know what sigma is, right? Just like I don't know what the population mean is, I don't know the population standard deviation. However, just like the mean, the standard deviation of the sample approximates the standard deviation of the population. So I'm going to use the standard deviation of the sample instead of the population. I'm going to call that 12. Okay. So when I calculate standard error, I'm going to use the standard deviation over the square root of n, standard deviation of my sample. So the standard error is going to be equal to 12 over 10. It's going to be equal to 1.2. Okay, now this is a large sample size, right? So I'm going to use the z-score here for a moment. I'm going to change it up a little in a little bit. So I'm going to use the z-score for a moment. So I'm going to I'm going to multiply this by 1.2. So my 95% confidence interval now is going to be, and I'm going to use my calculator to do this. Okay, I hope I can use my calculator. There it comes. There it comes. Okay, let's see what we have here. It's going to be equal to 1.96 times 1.2. That's going to be our margin of error. Okay, I'm going to put that into memory. And I'm going to clear that. I'm going to say our, that's our, that's our, uh, this is our, this is our margin of error, 1.96 times 1.2. And I'm going to subtract that from, uh, from our mean, which is 160. Oops, 160 uh, minus our uh, margin of error is 157.6. 157.6. And I'm going to add it to our margin of error. 1.96 plus, whoops, 1, that thing, no way, 1.96. 96 plus our margin of error is going to be oh, oh, longer. Ah, 1.96 plus I'm, I'm sorry what am I doing excuse me I meant 160 plus our margin of error is 162.4 I'll call it yeah, 162.4. I'm trying to rush through this. 
2.4. Okay, so we're 95% sure that the true population mean is equal to, uh, is, is, well, appears to be 160, but uh, we're 95% certain that it really is between 157.6 and 162.4. We're 95% certain. Now, notice if I wanted to be 99% certain, I would have used 2.58 which would have made the margin of error bigger. So I would have subtracted and added a larger number to X bar. So my interval would have been wider than, than for uh, uh, 95%. So, which makes sense. If you, if you want to be more confident that you've captured the population mean between two numbers, you got to move the two numbers further apart. That makes you more confident. Right. If I want, if I'm willing to settle for 90% confidence, I could make that range narrower. In fact, using 1.96 would make that range narrower. Okay. Now, there's only one problem here that I've introduced, and that is, is that all of this idea, this use of the central limit theorem, to figure this stuff out of the way samples behave. Right. That was whole, that whole thing with the with the uh, uh, normal approximation of the, 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 uh, the, the uh, distribution of sample means being normal and the relationship uh, with uh, standard error. And so that's all part of the central limit theorem. Now, in order to make this work properly, I need to know the true variability of the people in the population. But I don't, because I don't know sigma. So I had to depend on the standard deviation of a sample. So when I do that, I've introduced an element of uncertainty that wasn't there when I when I when I uh, used the pot when I said that I knew the population standard deviation. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you have to account for that uncertainty. Okay, and you account for that uncertainty by using not the z distribution, the z table but a different table called the T distribution. Okay, and the T distribution is basically the normal distribution, except it accounts for that extra error. So in other words, if the normal distribution looks like this, the T distribution, right, looks a bit different. It's spread out more like that. Okay, well, they'd have the same mean, but it's, you get the idea. It's spread out more. Okay, how spread out is it? Well, that's, that's the rub. How spread out is it? In fact, the amount that the t-distribution is spread out depends on the sample size. The larger the sample size, the less it's spread out, the closer to the normal distribution, the z-table that it is. Okay, and the smaller the sample size, the more spread out, the further from the uh, uh, t -dist z-distribution that it is. But notice what happens when you make it spread out. That means that now, when if you want to be in the if you want to have a range that represents 95% of the values, you have to be more than 1.9 standard deviations away from the mean. You have to be maybe 2.1, or for a smaller sample, 2.3, or even more away from the mean. So a t-score that would represent the same thing, uh, 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 the same area would be further away from the mean. In other words, a larger number. And, and in order to calculate this for a second, you might say, gee, I need a new table, a new table for every possible sample size. For sample size of two or three, four, five, I need a new table. But technically that's true if you wanted to calculate exact areas. But fortunately, the way we usually use the t-table, the t-distribution, when we know when we have a, a sample from a uh, population, sample from a population, and we don't know sigma, we only know standard deviation. The way that we use it is usually for a 95% confidence interval, 99, 90 confidence, 90% confidence interval. So all we really need to know is for a particular sample size what these numbers are, what it is instead of 1.96. What should we be using instead? Instead of 99, instead of 2.58, what should we be using instead? And in fact, we have a t-table that does exactly that. Okay, here's our t-table. This is how our t-table is structured. So I know 
that if I have a sample size of 25, for 95% confidence interval, instead of using 1.96, I have to use 2.06. I have to make my margin of error a little bit bigger to accommodate for the extra uncertainty that I have because I'm using the standard deviation of the sample instead of the no sigma for the entire population. So I would have to use that number. And for a sample size of 10, I would have to use that number. Now, some of you may notice I already kind of lied a little bit, right? This number over here is not really the sample size, it's the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom is only, is the sample size of minus one. So for a sample size of 25, I would be using 24, 2.064. For a sample size of 100, I would be using 1.98. Notice, as the sample size gets bigger, we get very close, we get closer and closer and closer to 1.96. In fact, many statisticians for their first pass through the data to test, you know, to take do a quick test of their hypothesis. They'll just, if it's a big sample size, like over 100, right, they'll just use 1.96 right off the bat rather than worry about the, the difference between 1.98 and 1.96. Okay, when you use SPSS, SPSS, it doesn't matter if the uh, uh, sample size is 10,001. SPSS will always use the t-value because it has a mechanism for cal calculating every t-value built into it. So it will always use t no matter what the sample size is. For you, if it's a sample size over 100, if you wanted, you could use the z-value, 1.96, 2.58, so on. So if I wanted to apply this in this case, right? Let's see what I can do here. If my X bar, I'm going to take the same sample I had before, is 100. My sample is 160. My sample size is equal to 100. My um, uh, uh, standard deviation of my population is equal to 12. And if I wanted to calculate 95% confidence interval for this, I would say X bar plus or minus not 2 point, not 1.96, but 1.98 times my standard error, which was 1.2, right? If it was a 20, if my sample size was 25, my 95% confidence interval would be X bar plus or minus 2.064 times my uh, standard, uh, standard deviation, which was standard error, I mean, standard error, uh, which is 1.2, right? Um, I'm sorry, that's standard deviation. My standard error is equal to 12 over in this case, 5, in this case, 5, which would also change this as well, which is make this to 2.4, right? My standard error changes because my sample size affects my standard error also, in addition to the value of t that I'm using. So in this case, it's x bar plus or minus the value of t for the level of certainty you want times your standard error instead of z. Okay, so I'm going to pause for a moment. And I'm going to look over to the chat box and ask you if you guys are comfortable with that so far. Okay, some of you answer, some of you got ahead of me and you asked a question about, you know, you didn't know sigma, so why did you use the z-score and stuff like that? So you recognize what was going on there. Okay, it's really pretty simple at the basis, base, basics of it. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand on that. I'm going to say to myself, you know, I'm going to find another way to apply this. Okay, and that other way to apply it is, is to say, you know, let's say that, that I have a population who I know the mean of. I know the mean is equal to, uh, say, 100. Maybe that's um, uh, blood sugar level for seniors uh, in um, uh, in nursing care facilities in New York City. They uh, they all get they all get tested probably, so we can get that data and get that and know what the mean for the population is. Okay. Now let's say I'm going to say for our argument's sake we don't know what sigma is. We only know the mean. We don't know what sigma is. Okay. So let's say that hmm, let's say that I want to compare that. To the population of that of people that seniors same age range that are not institutionalized that are not in nursing homes 
right? So I would go out and I would say, I'm going to get a sample. I'm going to, I'm going to find the average for a sample size of 64. I'm going to randomly sample 64 adults, seniors, the same age and, and uh, 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 background of the people that are in these nursing homes. And I would say, let's find, what, find out what the average of that is. Turns out the average is 90. And then I'm going to say to myself, what's the standard deviation of my sample of 64? Turns out that that's 20. Okay. So now I say to myself, okay, you know, I can create a confidence interval here, right? I can say X bar plus or minus the true population mean I would expect here uh, uh, for this, for these seniors here, X bar plus or minus 90, oh, excuse me, X bar plus or minus the stand, uh, 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 excuse me, since it's a sample size of 64, my T value times my standard error. Okay, so let's see, X bar plus or minus, what's my T value going to be? Well, I got to go to my table and look that up. My T value is going to be 63 degrees of freedom. Uh, we're going to have to get just the closest one to this. I'm going to, I'm going to use 60 for argument's sake. 2.0, that makes it easy, right? I'll remember that when I get back here. So my T value is 2.0 times my standard error. What's my standard error equal to? It's equal to my standard deviation over the square root of my sample size, okay, which is equal to 20 over 8, and that's equal to 2.5. Okay, so I got my standard error is 2.5. So my 95% confidence interval is going to be uh, it's going to be 90 plus or minus 2 times 2.5 is 5. It's going to be 85 to 95. Well, gee, look what I just, if, if I'm 95% sure that the mean for this population of seniors outside the nursing home is between 85 and 95, and I know the mean for the population in nursing homes is 100, well, that 100 is outside of the confidence interval. So I can say probably that that mean, that the, the means of these two groups, mean blood sugar levels of these two groups, is different. On the other hand, if the mean of this population had been 94, well, you know, I could, it could be that the mean for this population is 94. It's within that confidence interval, right? So I can't say with 95% certainty that they're different. Well, this is a good, nice, interesting way to use this. In reality, we don't really use this analysis this way. We, we, we turn it around a little bit and we use a method that's a bit more defensible in terms of uh, uh, the math and the probabilities. And what we do is we do something called a t-test. The t-test takes two means, means of two populations, and it determines how many standard errors apart that they are to determine whether they're far enough apart to say with a certain level of certainty, say 95% certainty, that those, the means of the two populations that they came from are really different. Okay, so in this case, I only have one sample here, right? I'm comparing this sample to a known value, the known value of the mean for this population. We call that a single sample t-test. We'll be getting to two sample t-tests in a moment. So let's calculate what t would be in this case. How many standard errors apart are these two averages? So let's see, the t-score would be equal to equal x bar, the value for the mean of this group that I don't know mu for this group, so I got to use x bar, minus mu over the standard error. So if my sample size was 64 and my standard deviation was 20 for this sample, right, well then this would be 2.5 on the bottom. So this is going to be equal to x bar is, is, nine, is uh, what was it, x bar is 90 minus 100 over 2.5, right? So my t-score is equal to 10 over 2.5 is equal to 4, right? So um, uh, uh, in fact, it's equal to negative 4, right? Because mu is bigger, right? It doesn't matter what the sign is. We're only concerned about how far apart they are. It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Well, we know from the, for this sample size, we know that we can be 95% certain that they're not from the same population if we exceed two standard, two standard errors apart, 2.0 standard errors apart. 
If the sample size had been 25, we would have had to exceed 2.06 standard errors apart to be not 95% sure that they're different. If the sample size were 10, we'd have to exceed 2.23 standard deviations apart. For that reason, what we want to do is we want to say, does this number that we've calculated, the t-score that we've calculated, exceed the value that we need to, to, to uh, exceed to be 95% sure that they're different? Because of that, this value, like for instance, in this case, uh, sample size 64, this value of 2.0, we call that our critical value for t. That critical value is the value that we need to exceed to say that these two means are different. So in this case, our, our t score was 4.0. We have exceeded the, the uh, 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 critical value of t, which was 2.0. And we can say that these two means, at least with 95% certainty, are different. Well, we're going to turn that around here now in a second. Instead of saying it that way, we're going to say that instead of saying that we're 95% certain that this is true, that they're different, we're going to say that there's less than 5% chance of being wrong if we say that they're different. Same thing. We're 95% certain that they're different where, where, where uh, uh, there's less than 5% chance we'd be wrong if we said that they were different. Instead of calling this co a confidence interval, now we call this a, a, our margin, of, uh, our acceptable level of error, and we call that alpha error. This kind of error is termed alpha error, okay? So we set the level of error that we want at the beginning. For 95% confidence, we set it an alpha error is equal to 0.05. For 99% confidence, alpha is equal to 0.01, and so on. Okay, so our t-score tells us whether or not we can say that they're different with at least less than this level of chance, uh, chance of error. Now, how do we phrase that? The way that we phrase that is very important. Okay, the way that we phrase that is we start with the assumption that the two means of the populations the mean of the population uh, population uh, uh, outside the nursing homes is equal to the mean of the population inside the nursing homes. We start with the assumption that they're equal, and we force ourselves to prove that they're not equal. Does not equal the mean for the population inside, right? We call this first this first hypothesis the null hypothesis, and we call the second one the alternative hypothesis. Null kind of means no difference, right? So, so this is the way we're going to phrase this. If our t-score is bigger than the critical value of t for that sample size, we reject the null hypothesis and we accept the alternative hypothesis. Now, we let's say that it, instead of 4.0, it came out to be 1.9. Anybody here remember what the critical value of T was for a sample size of 60, 64, whatever it was? Anybody remember what it was? It was 2.0. Well, our T-score is less than 2.0. So we don't have enough evidence. The means are not far enough apart for us to say with 95% certainty, less than 5% chance of being wrong, that they are indeed different, right? In that case, we fail to reject the null hypothesis, right? Now, notice the, the terminology there. In the first case, we rejected the null hypothesis and we accepted the alternative hypothesis. If we don't manage to prove it, then we just say we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Failing to reject does not mean that this is true, right? It may just mean that we didn't have enough evidence to prove that they were different. In this case, it probably looks like that, right? We almost had enough evidence to prove it, but not quite, right? So, so we fail to reject, but we don't say we accept it. We, the null hypothesis, we say only that we failed to reject it. Okay, so that's how we structure our null and our alternative hypothesis. Okay, let's pause again and let's ask some questions. How do you guys feel about that? Are you okay with that? Yeah, so you're only ever, well, when you do it like this by hand, you're only comparing your T value calculated to your critical value of T. 
when we use SPSS, we're going to finish up by using SPSS to do these problems as well. Okay, so uh, in a moment, we're going to give that. We, after we do this next part, we're going to give that a try. Okay, so now let's take a look at our, um, uh, uh, let's take a look at the what would happen if now we have two samples. Okay, so now let's, let's say we have two samples now. Now I'm going to take the same example as before. I'm going to say we take a sample from uh, seniors living outside an institution, right? And um, their blood sugar level, average blood sugar level is equal to 90. And inside, I take a sample also. I don't know that I don't know all of them. I have to get a sample. So this is out and this is in. And the mean for in is 100. Okay. But we don't know the we don't know that we only know the sample mean. This sample, I'm going to say they're both the same size. Just to make things simple. This sample this sample is equal to uh, 50 people, and this sample is equal to 50 people. Right? Just say that they're the same. So now this one, I take the standard deviation of the people, uh, the sample that I took, these 50 people, and the standard deviation is equal to uh, 10. I take the standard deviation of the 50 people I took in here, and the standard deviation is equal to 12. Okay, so now I'm going to check to see if these are really different. I'm going to do a t-test. So my t-test is going to be equal to, and by the way, when we do it this way, generally what we consider are degrees of freedom are equal to n1 plus n2 minus 2. So our degrees of freedom is going to be equal to, is going to, be equal to uh, 98. And, and the t-critical, I happen to remember, it's probably going to be around 1.98, right? Not, not 1.96 because that would be z. But t-critical is going to be pretty close because they're a pretty big sample size, right? So let's see if we see t-critical, right? t is equal to x bar out minus x bar in over the standard error. Okay, let's let's work this out. That's 90 minus 100. Remember, the sign's not really going to mean anything here. It's not going to be a difference. Over the standard error. What's the standard error? Standard error is equal to standard deviation over the square root of n. Oh, oh wait, wait a second. I got a problem here. I got a standard deviation of 10 here and a standard deviation of 12 here. Which one of these two should I use? Right. Well, that's a that's a problem for me now. Right. Well, we have a document on Blackboard. OK. And this document will give you the formulas that we're going to use going forward to do these analysis. Now, do you guys recognize this document? You it, you've seen it right on Blackboard. Correct. I want to make sure it's there. I'm sure it's there. I'm, I'm not sure exactly which session or where, which folder or something like that, but I'm sure it's there. So. Somebody confirm for me that they've seen this before. Okay, good. So it is there. Okay. So now what does this tell you? This tells you how to proceed if you have standard deviations that you're going to assume to be equal for two populations using hypothesis testing. This is a two-sample t-test. This is the formulas you use and the way you proceed if you're going to assume that the standard deviations are not equal. And then there's another formula out here to how to deal with you know, a t-test when you're working with proportions, two proportions, uh, the uh, proportion of the vote that de Blasio gets versus the support the, or Cuomo gets versus the proportion of the vote that Cynthia Nixon gets, let's say. You're comparing two proportions, right? So so let's, let's go back here and take a look at these formulas. Okay, so now we want to use, in order to uh, do our work here, we need to know what to use as the standard error. We need to know what to put underneath here. That's really what's going on here. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, you can see down here, this is our t. t is equal to x1 minus x2. This whole thing on the bottom is our standard error. And normally it would have been standard deviation over the square root of the sample size, like combining the sample sizes or something like that. But things got complicated here, right? It's really something called a pooled standard deviation times the square root of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Oh, Mike, what is, what is this pooled standard deviation? Well, the pooled standard deviation is basically a weighted average of the standard deviation of the two groups. How do you calculate that? 
Well, sample size of the first group, 50 minus 1 is 49, times the square of the standard deviation. And standard deviation, if I recall, was 10. So this would be 100 plus sample size 2, which is 40, 50 minus 1 is 49, times square of the standard deviation of the other one, 12, which would be 144, over 50 plus 50 minus 2 is 98. We calculate this, put this in here, and then do this part, resolve the square root, multiply them, and divide it into x1 minus x2. That would give us our t-score, which we would check against our degrees of freedom, uh, the correct the, the correct t-critical for our degrees of freedom. Again, it was n1 plus n2 minus 2, would be 98, which would have been about 1.98. And we would decide then whether to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, sounds complicated, right? Well, how do I know which of these to use? This is 1 is 10, 1 is 12. Do they have to be exactly equal? Well, the answer to that is no. They don't have to be exactly equal. However, they should be close. For our purposes, for our purposes for this course, we're going to decide, we're going to uh, 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 describe equal variances, assumed to be equal variances, uh, as long as the standard deviation of one group is not double the standard deviation of the other. Okay, so if this is 10 and this is 12, fine, equal variances. We're going to assume equal variances. If this is 10 and this is 15, still okay. If this is 10 and this is 30, no good. We're going to assume them to be unequal variances. So as long as they're not, one is not double the other, okay? So let's go ahead and use this formula. Okay, let's actually work one of these things out. Okay, so now I need to do this so I can remember the formula so I won't forget it and be able to write this whole thing out. So let's let's calculate this. Okay, so my pooled standard deviation is equal to the square root of 49 times 100, S1 squared, plus 49 times 144 over 98. Okay, I'm going to get my calculator out. Okay, I'm sorry I'm rushing this so much, but uh, on the other hand, you're going to be able to go back over this and, and slow it down and, and run it slowly and see how, we, see how you feel about it. So 49 times 100, 4,900, of course. I'm going to clear memory here, and I'm going to add it to my memory. And I'm going to clear this, and 49 times... 144 is equal to this, and I'm going to add it to memory 2. Then I'm going to clear this, and I'm going to recall this, and I'm going to divide it by 98. Okay, that's my everything that's underneath this, uh, um, this uh, 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 radical, and then I'm going to find the square root of it. And it comes out to be 11.04, very close to 11, which you kind of would expect, right, kind of a weighted average. So I'm just going to call it 11. Don't make any assumptions. Actually, actually work it out. Okay, I, it's gonna. I'll call it 11, 11.05. I'll call it. Okay, so that's my pooled standard deviation. Well, now I have to calculate my t-score. My t-score is going to be equal to. It's going to be equal to x bar one minus x bar two, which is ninety. Uh, so it's over there. I, I I can see. I can't can't get to it on my screen, unfortunately. You can see it, but I can't get to it. Over the pooled standard deviation, I'll call it 11 now because I, I want to get through with this, over 1 over 50 plus 1 over 50. Okay, so now that's going to be 10 over, I'm not worried about the sign really, minus 10 if you want to keep it that way, 1 50th plus 1 50th is 2 50ths, right? So let me get my calculator out. 2 50ths is 0.04. Clear, 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 clear. Right, 2 divided by 50 is, is, is 0.04. Right, it's 0.04, right? And I'm going to take the square root of 0.04. Okay, square root of 0.04 is, of course, 0 0.2. 0 0.2 times 0.2 would be 0.04, right? And I'm going to multiply that by 11. Equals 2.2. 2.2. Is my standard error on the bottom? So this is going to wind up being 10 divided by 
my t-score is going to wind up being 4.5, right? So does my t-score exceed my critical value of t? I'm asking you guys now. Uh, it's n minus 1. That's why I use 49. Yes, it does. So that means, what can I say here? Mu1 is equal to mu2. That's uh, that's our null hypothesis. Mu1 does not equal mu2. That's our alternative hypothesis. What can I do here with my, with my null hypothesis and my alternative hypothesis? I reject my null hypothesis, and I accept my alternative hypothesis. Okay, now, you, you do the same deal with if you have unequal variances. I'm not going to do it. I just don't have time for it. Okay, uh, you do the same thing, except that if you have unequal variances, they're more than one is more than double the other. You use this formula to calculate. You don't calculate pooled standard deviation, but you still have to accommodate for the two different standard deviations, right? So it's x1 minus x2, the mean of one group, the mean of one group, over the square root of the standard deviation squared over sample size plus standard deviation squared over sample size. Take the square root, of the combine it, take the square root of the whole thing, and that would give you your t score. The only problem is, actually, it looks a little simpler than, if you're careful, it's actually a little simpler than pooled standard deviations. But the only problem is, is that calculating the degrees of freedom is really complicated. So you want to know what happens. A lot of times people say to themselves, you know, uh, if one sample size is, is uh, uh, 50 and the other sample size is 100, right? You'd say to yourself, well, gee, Maybe, maybe the degrees of freedom are going to be somewhere between 50 and 100. I don't know where it's going to be, but it's going to be somewhere between 50 and 100. Maybe I'll just take the smaller sample size, 50, subtract 1, and call my degrees of freedom 49. You're punishing yourself a little bit because you could have picked a higher, a higher number than that because a small sample makes it harder to prove because you're the n. Because this, your standard your standard error becomes uh, your degree your critical value of t becomes a bigger number when you have a small sample when you say forty nine instead of instead of what it really is probably between fifty and hundred but the good thing about that is it's very conservative and you know it's going to be bigger so so you're not going to make the error of rejecting the null hypothesis when you don't have a right to. That's called an alpha error. You don't want to do that, right? Because an alpha error, you're saying the mean here is different than the mean here, means that then you may have to do some expensive intervention. You know, uh, try and figure out why the mean, why nursing homes uh, patients are have higher blood sugars and and do a, and maybe do an intervention and maybe treat them and so on and so forth. Uh, do extensive testing. So at any rate, so alpha errors are bad. You only want to reject an all hypothesis. Uh, 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 when it deserves to be rejected. Okay, occasionally you make an error because it's not 100%. You know, less than 5% chance of being wrong is satisfactory, but uh, you, you don't want to inadvertently uh, reject it when you shouldn't be. Okay, so the calculation of degrees of freedom becomes complicated. Okay, so, but that's the way you would do it. Okay, and if you step through this, you'll see this, and it'll tell you what to do. State your null alternative hypothesis, determine your level of confidence, in other words, alpha is equal to 0.05 or alpha is equal to 0.01 uh, and so on and so forth. Then run through this and then look up what your T value, your critical value of T is, compared to the value you calculated and decide whether to reject your null hypothesis. And you do the same thing for proportions as well. Well, I, I'm not going to go into that right here. So now what I want to do is I want to demonstrate this using SPSS. Okay, And we have a whole bunch of stuff that you've already probably looked at in the videos and stuff like that, but I'm going to take, put, pull it up anyway. Okay, I'm going to open up this file, single sample, and remember it's single sample because we're assuming there's a known mean, okay, uh, that we're comparing it to. So we don't have two groups. You have a known mean, and you're comparing a sample from a different group to that mean of a known mean of another population. Okay, it's going to warn me that um, my license is up. Good. Okay, I got another few days on this. I think. Okay, I wonder if I can last it out. Uh, well, I last it out maybe the end of the semester, you guys, but not my eight-week course. At any rate, so let's see. There's the data view. 
these are some numbers, nine subjects, right? And notice it thinks it's categorical, this variable, because they're small numbers. I got to tell it. I have to go back here and tell it it's really a scalar variable, just so that it knows it's a number, so I can do my calculations. So I want to compare the mean of this sample, sample size nine. I want to compare the mean of it to some other values. So I'm going to say, well, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to say analyze. And since I want to compare means, I'm going to go down to compare means. Okay, compare means one sample t-test, which is what I'm doing here. And one sample t-test, I'm going to take our the variable, the column. I'm going to move it into my test variables, okay, and tell it that I want to compare whatever mean that is to the value, uh, I'm going to say value uh, 11, okay. The mean for another for a population that's known is 11. Right, so so I'm going to compare this, the mean of this population based on this sample mean to a known mean of 11 from another population. Okay, I'm going to click OK, and SPSS is going to calculate the t-score for me. So it calculated the t-score is minus 1.136, eight degrees of freedom. Where did it get that? Well, there's only one sample there, so it's n minus one, nine minus one, significance 0.289. What does that mean? Okay, well, first of all, with a sample with eight degrees of freedom, we know that we know that it, my t table disappeared. We know that if you have eight degrees of freedom, if you have eight degrees of freedom, then your t critical is 2.306, 2.3, right? So you need to ex to exceed 2.3 to reject your null hypothesis. And what was our t-score here when we compared it to 11? It was 1.16. Can I reject my null hypothesis? No, right? I can't because it hasn't exceeded my critical value of t. Well, you want to know something. SPSS goes an extra mile here. SPSS actually calculates the probability that you would be wrong if you reject the null hypothesis. So the probability you would be wrong if you reject the null hypothesis is 0.289, okay? So almost 30% chance of being wrong if you reject the null hypothesis. What did we say was our criteria for the uh, level of error, alpha, alpha error we'd be willing to accept? Well, most likely it's 5%. So since this is bigger than 5%, we're unwilling to accept that level of error. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So if we want to reject the null hypothesis, we can look at this two ways. We can look at the t-score and compare it to t-critical, or we can just simply look over here and see if this probability is p-value, what we call the p-value or the significance that SPSS calls it, that this value is less than 0.05. And it's less than 0.05, you'll find that you, you have a t-value that exceeds your critical value of t. Right, so that's how this works. This should be less than 0.05 to reject your null hypothesis, and it actually gives you the probability you'd be wrong as well. So now I'm going to give you another example here, a different file. Again, something you you may have seen if you if you went through the uh, videos. Let me go over here. Let's see to data. Now I'm going to go to a two sample t-test. This is an independent sample t-test. Two samples, two independent samples, one from one population, one from another, and we're comparing the two of them. Oh, it's opening it up again. What do you know? Okay. Okay, don't worry about that. All right, so let me take a look at my data window. Okay, here's my data. Well, in this one, we have two groups. Males and females. This is a categorical variable. This is a numerical variable, right? Categorical and nominal variable, ma males or females. So I want to compare these two groups, but I have, I, 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 I'll actually, before I do anything else, I'm going to say analyze, descriptive statistics, explore. Because I want to compare the means and standard deviations of these two groups. So I'm going to move the values the numbers that I want to find the mean and standard deviation of into the dependence and the gender into the factor list. Okay, 
So now I am going to say OK. And SVSS is going to calculate all these statistics for me. The mean for females, for females is 10. The mean for males is 7.56. Okay, it looks different, but these are small samples. We don't know yet if it's statistically significant. If we can say they're really different with less than 5% chance of being wrong, if we say that they're different. Okay, so what's the standard deviation here? Standard deviation here is 2.7. Standard deviation here is 1.94. So one is not double the other. So if I were doing this manually, I would just simply use the formulas for pooled standard deviation and for equal variances assumed. Well, in SPSS, we can actually go ahead and ask it to do this analysis. Analyze, compare means, except this time, I'm going to be looking at independent samples t-tests. And I'm going to move my variables into here and my gender into here. It needs to know that the values for male and female are 1 and 2. That's kind of a little bit of a technicality with SPSS. And I know that from memory, I would have to go back and look in the, uh, in the coding, in the variable page, in the variable view to see what they really were. But I happen to remember that. Okay, so I'm going to click OK. So now SPSS is going to do our t-test for us. Compare x1 minus x2 over the standard error that's calculated based on the uh, 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 pooled standard deviation. Oops. Whoops. Okay, let's get this back again, get the output window back up. Okay, and what do we wind up with? So notice that it first calculates the mean standard deviation and the standard errors for each separate group. And then it does our t-test. Now, you'll notice that there's a line here up and down here, almost right under the eye. It's kind of hard to see. You may not be able to see it um, um, on your end, but there's a thin line over here that separates this part from this part. This part's the actual T test. This part is Levine's test for the equality of variances. And SPSS actually does the test twice. It does it once assuming equal variances. That's the top row. And it does it again assuming unequal variances. And for the top row, it uses pooled, st pooled standard deviation. And the, for the bottom row, it doesn't assume uh, it doesn't use pooled standard deviation. OK, so if I go across here, how do I know whether to use the top row or the bottom row? Well, if you went by our judgment before, where we said if the standard deviations are not, e not one's not double the other, use uh, assume, assume equal standard deviations, we would use the top line. But SPSS actually does a analysis of this. And just like the null hypothesis, we start with the assumption that the variances are equal. So we start with the assumption that we're going to use the top line. And then SPSS does a test it's called Levine's test for equality of variances. And it finds that the p-value, the probability of being wrong if you reject this null hypothesis, is 0.245. And since we're not likely to reject that unless it's under 0.05, we fail to reject this null hypothesis, so we just stick with the with the top line. Had this been less than two point less than 0.05, we would have said we reject that idea that they're equal and go to the bottom line instead. So let's take a look at what our t score was. Our t score was 2.184 for 16 degrees of freedom. Well, 16 degrees of freedom that would be 2.12. So we exceeded our critical value of t, so we would probably reject our null hypothesis. Let's see if SPSS agrees. I go across here, degrees of freedom 16, and the significance, the probability we would be wrong if we reject the null hypothesis is 4.4% or 0.044. This is less than 0.05. It agrees with my analysis of the, t, of, of the fact that I have exceeded the critical value of t. Both of these say reject the null hypothesis, and accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so now just to show you one more, and call it a night. Okay, just show you one more and call it a night. There's a, there is data here, which is for, uh, 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 where the data is uh, spread out a bit more. So they're actually not equal. I'm going to double click on it, get it started up again. I think I got the right one. 
Okay. Um, notice that set of numbers. Numbers are a little bit different than the other one. You will see that that's true in a second. I'm going to say analyze descriptive statistics. Let's get the means and stuff like that for these two groups. Okay. I'm going to move variables in there. I'm going to move gender in here. And I'm going to find out what the means look like and the standard deviations. Let's see how it looks. Let's see. The mean for males is 10. The mean for females is also still 7.56. But let's look at the standard deviation. For this one, it's 2.73. And for this one, the standard deviation is 1.04. So one is more than double the other. One to 2.7. One's more than double the other. Now I'm going to answer that question in just a second. Okay, so, so one is more than double the other. So now, let me see. If one is more than double the other, I'm not going to use a pooled standard deviation. I'm going to assume unequal variances. Let's see if SPSS agrees with me on that. I'm going to say analyze, compare means, independent samples, t-tests. I'm going to move the values in here. I'm going to move gender in here and again tell it that one represents male and two represents female. Okay, and say, okay, let's see our t-test this time. Well, this time, if I go over here and I look at my Levine's test for the equality of variances, the significance, the probability of being wrong if I reject equal variances is less than 0.05. So I reject equal variances and I go to uh, uh, unequal variance. Equal variance is not assumed down at the bottom here. And at the bottom tells me my t-test is 2.51. That looks like I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. And in fact, my p-value is 0 0.031, okay, or le uh, less than my 5% acceptable uh, level of error. Okay, so we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. Let me just get to this question. Da, da, da. If you reject the null hypothesis, do you automatically accept the The answer to that, I think, is yes. I'm not sure. I'm not, I can't think of a situation where you wouldn't. Uh, I, had a question was, I had a question that said, if you reject the null hypothesis, does that mean you necessarily accept the alternative hypothesis? And I think logically the answer to that would be yes. But I don't think I, I don't think anybody's asked. It's an interesting question. I don't think I've heard that in a while. Right? So think about it. If if your alternatives are that they're equal and the other alternatives that they're not equal, if you reject the idea that they're equal, then they must be so you only have no other choice, then they must be unequal. Right? So yeah, I would say that necessarily you accept the alternative if you reject the uh, no. Uh, the F is a statistical is it's a, st a result of a statistical test. In other words, just like everything else, if you went to a table, you could count, you could figure out what the p-value would be based on what that f-value comes out to. Okay, I wouldn't worry about like how it's calculated and so on, but but just keep in mind that this is one of the tools that you can use to decide whether to use equal variances assumed or unequal variances assumed. Okay, so so uh, one of the things I haven't shown you is uh, paired samples t-test and with paired samples t-tests what you're doing with paired samples t-tests let me just open that up uh, you know I, I don't remember if it's on the test at all but just so the, uh, we cover that paired samples t-tests okay, let me oops I opened the excel file instead of the here we go. Let me open this up. Let me kill the Excel file. Okay. In paired samples t-test, what you're doing is you're taking a subject and you are testing him in two different situations. So for instance, Let's say you have a drug you want to test. One of the ways you could test that drug is to give it to nine people, give it to nine people, and find out what the average drop in their blood pressure is, let's say. And then you could take a placebo and give that to nine people and see what the average decrease in their blood pressure is after they're done. Okay? The only problem with that is it's two different groups of people. So maybe the placebo group, maybe they smoke more, maybe they're BMI is higher than the drug group. There could be a lot of variables in there that are hard to balance out of a study. So instead, let's take a person, 
Let's tell them to take a, a placebo for two weeks and check their blood pressure. Now take the drug for two weeks and test their blood pressure. So now you've removed a lot of these extraneous variables and confounders because you're testing the placebo and the drug on the same person. So you should be able to get a better idea of what the effect is on those people. So now, in, a, in, in effect, what you're doing is you're doing this for everybody. A lot of times with these studies, what they'll do is they'll alternate. Like this person, you know, randomly alternate. This person got the placebo first. This one got the, this one got the drug first. This one got the placebo first. This one got the drug first, and so on. Right? So you don't have a, an effect where one would impact the other. So really what we're interested is the difference between the result of the placebo and the drug. In other words, the difference between placebo and drug, one minus the other. So really what we're looking for is the difference between these, uh, between each one of these. So this one's going to be six. This one's going to be zero. This one's going to be two. This one's going to be four. This one's going to be negative three. This is going to be going to be two, This and so on and so forth. And you take all of these differences and average the differences. Okay, you average the differences. Now, if the drug and the placebo do the same thing, in other words, the drug is ineffective, doesn't do anything. What would you expect to be the difference, the, the, av the average difference between the drug and the placebo? What do you think it might be? You think it might be zero, right? No difference, right? Sometimes it'll go up, sometimes it'll go down, they'll all cancel out, and the average difference should be zero. So your null hypothesis for this kind of test might be the difference between placebo and, and drug is equal to zero, and your alternative hypothesis is that the difference between the placebo and the drug is not equal to zero. Yeah, significant. You can stick with the significance instead of the t test. Okay, so so this is what the the paired sample t test does. It really is looking for the. It's a single sample t test where you you're testing the average of the differences to the value zero to see if you can say that they're really different. Okay, so I'm going to say analyze, compare means, paired sample t-test, and I'm going to move the first value, the first variable over here, and notice I can't hit OK until I move the second one in there, because you need two of them. Okay, I'll click OK, it'll perform the t-test, and here we go, here's our single, single sample t-test where we're comparing it to zero. Okay, let's see, mean, standard deviation, standard error, Here's our confidence interval for the difference, which is minus 0 0.5 to plus 3. Well, gee, that's not, it looks like 0 could be in that range. I'm not encouraged. So what is the T-score? The T-score is 1.75, and our probability of being wrong if we reject the null hypothesis, which was that the difference is equal to 0, right? A uh, 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 probability of being wrong would be 0 0.122, 12%. That's more than 0 0.05, so I fail to reject my null hypothesis that the difference between the placebo and the drug is zero. In other words, there's no difference between the two of them. Okay, so we fail to reject our null hypothesis there. Okay, so I think that, I think we've beaten this to death for tonight. This was, uh, 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 this was uh, a high-speed review of, uh, of uh, 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 central limit theorem, uh, calculation of standard error, t-tests, hypothesis testing, and so on and so forth. Hope it, I hope it helps a bit on the test. So you guys work hard on the test. You got two shots at it. Uh, um, unfortunately, I can't slow down. This is a six-week course. I can't slow down. So I'll be posting tonight material on the next topic, which happens to be uh, uh, um, chi-square analysis and odds ratio. Really interesting stuff. I'll get it posted. And uh, hopefully we'll get all this other stuff out of the way so uh, uh, we can start uh, getting through the last part of this course, the last week or so of this course, uh, uh, and, and, get, and, get, and get under about chi-square analysis. And then next Monday, analysis of variance. And uh, which is analysis of variance, by the way, you may have thought about this. Well, what if I have more than two, two groups? What if I want to compare the uh, blood pressure across four different ethnicities. And I have four different samples of four different means. Could, do I use a t-test for that? 
What's the problem with that? Because then you would have to compare group. T tests only for two groups. You have to compare group one to group two, group one to group three, group one to group four, group two to group one, group two to group two. Very good. You'd have to do it many times. And you would increase your error because repeating it, 5% chance each time of being wrong, you'd uh, uh, repeat your error. Analysis of variance is a way of comparing means that allow you to compare many groups for the means at the same time to see if there is a different. When is the final? Well, the final, you got to have a choice. I'll post something on Monday. Uh, you'll have a week to do it. I don't know when they're going to force me to get the grades in. That this really, this course is brutal. Um, I don't know when they'll take it, uh, force me to get the grades in. I will either post an exam, which will cover chi-square and analysis of variance on Wednesday, uh, which you'll have until probably, I don't know, maybe Friday to complete. Or I will post instructions on Monday on something that you can do instead, which I call a project. It's really not that intense a project. But I will give you a database that has a lot of variables in it, and you can choose which of those variables that you want to test. It might have information about diabetes and insurance and, and whether people have insurance and, and uh, BMI and so on and so forth. You can decide which of the variables you want to examine. So, for instance, you might want to examine whether people who are insured are more likely to get uh, vaccinated for influenza. You might want to check to see if people who um, people who exercise uh, uh, a lot have a lower average BMI than people who don't exercise a lot, or whether there's a difference between ethnicities or boroughs or something like that, right? So I will post something in the description by Monday of that, and, uh, and uh, we will try and get through the last bit of this whole thing as quickly as possible. Okay, guys? So let's call it a night. I'll 